I suppose they can border on the mundane, but shrubs, well, actually they're an important part of many successful gardens. We'll take a closer look at this landscape right after this. Over the past 20 years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore ways to create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped to transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about blurring the lines between inside and out and expanding our outdoor living space. Now, in today's show, we're going to talk about something that I think is often underappreciated, and that's shrubs. Now, don't yawn or change the channel. Shrubs are interesting. And what I want to do is show you how interesting they are here at this location. This is a garden that I designed or started designing back before I got into the television business. Got a little plant here, a Boston ivy, <laughs> all the way from Boston. Welcome to the Arkansas Governor's Mansion. Back when I created parts of this landscape, it was the playground for the then first daughter, Chelsea Clinton. But today, our goal is to explore the role shrubs are playing in the gardens of these grounds. So come on and let me show you some of the things around this place. I consider gardens old friends, and this part of the Arkansas Governor's Mansion I consider an old friend. It's a garden that I started in the mid-80s, and now I'm here to finish it up. Back then, I planted some shrubs along here. You see, the intent of this garden was to be a mixed border with a strong shrub background. The reason for it was threefold. One, to have a beautiful display garden here at the Governor's Mansion, a beautiful feature in itself. Secondly, a place to showcase heritage roses, some more old friends of mine. And third, a place that the first family could come out and cut flowers and use inside the mansion. Well, we're finally achieving that. Let me show you some of the things that I planted back in the mid 80s. Take the smoke tree, for instance. I love the deep, dark red color. It's a beautiful accent in this garden and great for cutting. Some of the other things I planted are burning bush, Elysium Floridanum, this beautiful Styrax or Japanese silver bell, along with some big forsythias. And probably the most interesting plant out here is a Harry Lauder's walking stick or contorted Coralus. This is a wonderful plant in flower arrangements, but particularly in the middle of winter because of its contorted form and interesting bark. Well, there I go, getting all excited about the plants without giving you a proper overview of the scale of this garden. Now, without the path, this thing is about 20 feet deep and 150 feet long. It's on a colossal scale. And I used a series of objects in this garden, both plants and man-made, to create a sense of rhythm all the way through. Now, let me remind you, across the back, I planted a Yopon holly hedge to serve as a canvas, if you will, to paint this picture upon. Now, the rhythm is created by a series of boxwoods, about seven or eight of them planted in a row across the front then with a blank section, and then a series of boxwoods. In the middle, I've placed some tutors that I designed several years ago, and these create the same rhythmic pattern across the bed. They're tall, vertical elements that we can grow some of my favorite old-fashioned roses on. The third element that gives it a sense of rhythm is just the way the colors are grouped, and right now, you can see these Asiatic lilies are really showing out with big splashes of pale salmon and pink. The definition of a big bed like this really is a mixed border because not only do we have shrubs, we have perennials. Look at these gorgeous lilies. Lots of different annuals, certainly planned to plant in here, as well as bulbs. That's why it's called a mixed border. But these elements, such as the tutor, help to organize the space. The rhythm helps to organize the space. Now, one of the purposes of this bed, as I mentioned, is to use it as a cutting garden. So 
what would I cut today if I was going to take a bouquet inside the house? Well, I'd certainly start with something in this color family, these soft apricots or melon colors. So I would use these as well as the coral beauty roses. I would add some pink with the fairy rose and also some of those pink lilies. And I would add an accent of soft lavender with the butterfly bush. It'll make a stunning combination. You know, I learned a long time ago that one of the best ways to figure out color patterns and a color palette for a flower bed is put together a bouquet of the flowers that you want to use in that bed. And we're doing just the opposite here. We're collecting them out of the garden and moving them into the house. Now, some other things that I've learned over the years I've applied here. One is the path system. It's the same system that I'm using at the garden home retreat. It's very simple. It's a generous path defined by steel edging. I started by getting the ground level and laying down a heavy duty filter fabric. After the filter fabric, we laid over a chat mix and then leveled it out. A good soaking of water followed by a dry spell and we were ready for business. In fact, just a few days after finishing the paths at the Garden Home Retreat, we hosted tours of the property as part of the International Master Gardeners Conference and it got a lot of wear and tear and I was pleased with the results. The other design element that I'm employing here is I'm lining this entire bed with catnip, a variety called Six Hills Giant. I've used it at the Garden Home Retreat and it makes a fantastic border planting. The soft lavender flowers bloom for a long time during the summer. Now I've grown catmint in my garden home for years. And while they say that an herb can be defined as any useful plant, I have to think that a definition like that doesn't make this plant sound like anything worth looking at. But catmint with its lavender spires and glaucous blue-gray foliage is certainly an attractive addition to any garden. The leaves were once used to make tea for colds. Over the years, I've come to really respect catnip, not so much for its medicinal uses, but for its beauty. These plants have been here for four years now, and each season they spring forth with an abundance of lavender blooms and aromatic foliage. The heaviest flowering of catnip for me occurs in mid to late spring. You can see it here blooming with the showy primrose and lamb's ear, a really nice combination. Now once these flowers fade, I'll cut the plants back to about three inches above the ground, and they'll flower again in early fall. The reason this little plant was named catnip is because cats love the scent of the fragrant oils in its leaves and stems. All you have to do is rub against them and you'll understand why the cats are so taken with it. Unlike some of the mint, such as spearmint and peppermint, cat mint really isn't as invasive, so it's ideal for gardens, both large and small. Now I wanted to bring you around here to show you a few things. Just take a look at the front of the building. Isn't it handsome? Well, this property has quite a history goes back to the 1840s. You see there was a house here that was built in the 18 mid 30s to 40s. It's called Rosewood and had a charming picket fence around it. Then it became a retirement home and after that a school and then in 1940 that school was pulled down and the bricks that you see in the current house today were used to build that structure and used in many of the paths you see on the grounds. Isn't it great to recycle? Just look at the patina on this brick. It just feels like this place, and it's because it came from this place. But as gardeners, when we're designing gardens, it's not always easy to find vintage materials. I love them because they do give a really beautiful aged look to the garden. At the garden home retreat, I wanted to use old brick to line the borders of the vegetable garden, but I couldn't find enough of one kind, so I'm using a new, but molded brick that looks like an old brick. It's really fantastic. I love the irregularities of it. This will serve as an edge, a mowing edge for that border, and I can just mow along and not have to do much weed eating. Okay, now let's talk about this garden itself and its design. Now it's made up really of four simple elements. The hardscape, which includes the paths, the fountain in the center, the brick border around the edge, the boxwood itself, which articulates the design, a bit of grass around the band, and inside a planting bed and a bit of planting on the other side. So really four simple elements. This boxwood is one of my favorites. It really doesn't have many problems. It's one called wintergreen, and it's a Buxus microphylla. About the only problem we've ever had with it here is a touch of spider mite. 
They cause stippling on the leaves and discoloration, and eventually the plant can defoliate. It just debilitates the plant. Now, what I've done here in the center is I've planted a petunia. We changed this out from season to season. Back in the spring, it was full of tulips and pansies, which were all planted in the fall. The pansies bloomed throughout the winter, the tulips came up and bloomed, and boy, were they glorious. Now, as you can see here, the summer color's going in. This particular petunia is one called white supertunia, and it is an incredible grower. If you want them to bloom like this all summer long, what we did was we worked in a slow release fertilizer in the soil upon planting, mulched the plants, and then every two weeks we hit them with an all-purpose liquid fertilizer. And man, watch out because they're going to take over this entire bed. Now one other thing I want to mention about how we maintain this particular bed is with the boxwood, we cut them on a slight bevel so the bottom of the boxwood kicks out a little higher than the top. You see, this makes sure that we don't start getting leggy at the bottom. The other thing that's important about a simple garden design like this is that the boxwood really serves as a backdrop for all of the flowers that get planted here throughout the year. Over the years, I've had the opportunity to design numerous public gardens. And like this one at the Governor's Mansion, you have to keep in mind the visitors who will actually use the space. At a nearby hospital, I created a healing garden. It was important for me to not only create an attractive, but a safe area for people to visit. Now here I used native stones from the local area to create the floor of the garden. Now these stones, because they came from nearby, saved energy and fossil fuels with the transportation cost. And I have to say, these stones added a soft, natural touch to what could have otherwise been a hard industrial hospital setting. When we prepared the soil for the plantings, we used natural amendments. And for feeding and pest control, we turned to organic solutions. Now this garden will have a similar application in that people use it and we wanted to create the raised beds in a way that would be comfortable to come out here and work and sit and enjoy what will be a beautiful space. You can see we're in full construction mode here in the vegetable garden. What we've done is we've created a series of raised beds and amended the soil with lots of organic humus. You see, the idea here is to go completely green from the soil preparation to the fertilizers we use to pest management. It's all safe and organic. Now, another thing we're doing, which I think is a rather good green component, you can see the irrigation system being laid out. It's a drip system, so we're conserving water. We're using only what we need to use. We're not spraying it all overhead. This is going to be an exciting and beautiful garden, and it's going to happen very soon. In the next couple of months, this will be full of vegetables. You know, you really can't underestimate the power of water in a garden. Now, I don't mean just watering our plants and the benefits water brings to a garden. I'm talking about the placement of a water feature it can bring another added layer of richness to a garden. This is the garden of Master Gardener Mary Lynn Tilly during the winter, and I want you to listen for just a second. Hear that? That's water. Even in the cold, bleak winter, Mary Lynn's garden is alive with the energy of rolling water. Now, roll over into late spring and take a look at this. Delightful ferns and mosses play against the rocks, and the water just keeps on rolling down. What a perfect complement to this woodland setting. You know, Mary Lynn's like a lot of gardeners. It really took her some time to get to know her property before she brought it up to its current mature state. So I thought it would be nice for her to tell you a little bit about her garden's evolution. I started um, really gardening hard about five years ago, and in those five years I've planted maybe 20, 25 trees. Uh, we've redone some things that we did when we first moved in. My interests have changed. I've gone from loving native plants to liking ornamentals. Uh, I still am interested in trees. I love bulbs. Um, I love shrubs. Um, I like my garden to have a four season interest, so I try to go that direction whenever I can. If something has uh, pretty bark in the winter and beautiful blooms in the spring, I want it in my yard. So in my garden, uh, 
Hydrangeas are the showstopper. I have daylilies out front in the sun and they're beautiful. I have roses that are blooming as well. I also have a sourwood tree that's blooming and it doesn't always bloom so I'm proud to say that it's blooming right now at this point. A few late blooming Kusa dogwoods are finishing up. I have a lot of rabbits, not real rabbits, in my garden. Um, my largest and my most favorite one is behind me. It used to be a red oak. It was here when we moved in. The house was built around it. Our garage was built around it. Our, our gardening was around it. But about three years ago, it started to die. And nothing we did, no help we had that came in helped it. And it was sad to watch it go. But almost at the end, I thought, well, we can do something else with that tree. And I called a chainsaw sculptor from um, Tulsa, Clayton Koss, who does a lot of chainsaw sculptures in his area, uh, came over and in one day found that inside that red oak lived that rabbit. And so he's been here for two years and I love him. So I try not to worry over something that fails. I try not to look at it as a failure. I try to think, okay, this is a new experience for me. Move on, find something else. And because gardening, I mean, it's that same old thing of life is short, enjoy your garden and do whatever it takes to enjoy your garden. What's happening on this porch is a major optical illusion. When the house went up, I thought, oh my gosh, this thing looks so tall, it looks so big. But the horizontal lines that you see with this porch coming across have helped to reproportion the house visually. So looking at it, it doesn't look nearly as tall. Now, these are 12 foot ceilings on the porch, which will make for a wonderful place to sit. The breezes will blow through here. And it should be very comfortable on a hot summer day. Some of the colors I plan to use here for the floor, I'm thinking about that classic battleship gray porch floor. I've used it for years, I like it very much. Now I may change my mind a little later as we get closer to painting. But I will tell you this, the ceiling will definitely be bird egg blue. This has worked so well for me. I use it for a very practical reason. You see, this color will dissuade flying insects such as dirt daubers and wasps from building their nests on that color. They'll build their nest on the white trim just below it, but they will not build their nest on that light blue color. It messes somehow with their depth perception. It looks like the sky to them, and they will not build a nest on what appears to be infinity. Now, you may be wondering, is this the finished column? No, we're going to have a classic Greek column on the front of this house, like you see in so many buildings around the country. They're classic from the 1820s, 30s, 40s, and 50s throughout this country. You see, these will be rather large, and they will help reproportion the front of the house yet again. And the color of them, well, they'll be the classic traditional white. Now, in a show all about shrubs, what would I be thinking if I didn't talk to you a little bit about my favorite category, antique shrub roses. In here, in the vegetable garden, which is the center, we have some wonderful examples of antique roses blooming today. One is called Lindy, one is called Doucher, and the other one is called Catherine Zumay, of which I've grown for years. And we're just getting them started in this area. One of the things that I do when I'm trying to get shrubs established in a garden is I often integrate perennials and annuals, and I've certainly done that here until these three shrub roses really take hold and fill in, I'm using annuals such as pansies and this wonderful spirit white cleome. Now, just take a look at really the showstopper in this particular part of the garden. It's this vitex, this one's called Shoal Creek, and it has gorgeous, gorgeous purple blooms on it. Well, you might say lavender. What I love about them beyond the color and the fact they bloom in the hot summer is that the honeybees adore this flower and I try to do everything I can to support the honeybee. Now in this part of the garden, I'm not trying to attract anything, I'm trying to get rid of certain things like weeds. Just take a look at this section of the garden. You can see this gorgeous hydrangea in full bloom and we'll get to that in just a moment. But what I want to do is point out how I'm keeping the maintenance down. You can see I've rolled out this landscape fabric around the base of these hydrangeas. The reason for this is to choke out weeds. 
Now don't get any ideas that you might use some of that black plastic. All that does is suffocate the soil. It does nothing for the health of your soil, needless to say, the health of your plants. This filter fabric allows moisture and air to exchange with the soil, which equals healthy soil. All right, now, once I get this fabric down, pinned down, I will put mulch on top of it, and I won't have problems with Bermuda grass, Johnson grass, and even nut sedge coming up in this part of the garden, which is huge because I can basically just kick back and enjoy these gorgeous shrubs. Now to the shrub itself. This is one called quickfire. The reason this hydrangea is called quickfire is that it blooms early in the season and it has a touch of red in some of the blooms as well as at the base of the leaves you can see this touch of red. Now what I like about this hydrangea is it will take full hot sun as you can see here and what will happen is all these shrubs will knit together and make a solid mass of blooms and these blooms will last from now well into the first coldest days of fall. Now another favorite shrub of mine is the butterfly bush or budlia. This always gets rave reviews from anyone who visits my garden. Now these are two new varieties that I'm growing here. One is called Adonis and the other is Peacock, which is a little more purple than Adonis, which is considered closer to a blue. Now what I like about these new varieties is that they're more compact than some of the other older varieties of Budlia. And just look at all the flowers on them. Now take a look at this. This is called Sunshine Blue Caryopteris, and it's another plant that can really steal the show in late summer. Early in the growing season, this plant is covered in chartreuse leaves, which can really cause an area of the garden to glow. Later in the season, it begins to put up these beautiful blue flowers, which really creates a magical combination. Okay, now you saw this one at the governor's mansion, and I also have one in my garden. It's the smoke tree. Just look at the gorgeous foliage on this plant. This variety is royal purple. Now these are young plants. If you decide to grow one of these, you need to make sure you have plenty of room because these plants can grow up to 15 feet tall and 15 feet wide. And we mentioned earlier bees. Well, this beauty is called an abelia. And let me tell you, the honey bees absolutely love it. If you've ever spent much time around an old home site and paid any attention to the plantings around it, you may have run across this shrub. So often we tend to undervalue things that have been around for a long time, things we've become familiar with we don't give them the consideration that perhaps they deserve. And I think this plant is an example of that. The abelia is one of the most adaptable old-fashioned shrubs you'll find. It prefers full sun, but will tolerate some shade. But the most attractive reason for growing this shrub is that it covers itself with these tiny trumpet-like flowers that will bloom from summer until late fall. These slightly fragrant flowers produce a lot of nectar, which makes the plant popular with beekeepers. Toward the end of the season, you begin to see more of these reddish colored sepals. They're actually the outer petals of the flowers, which are revealed once the blooms fade and fall. Their rich coloration makes them useful and interesting to the clever flower arranger. If you're interested in using this plant in floral design, allow it to grow into its loose natural form, although it can be clipped into a more formal hedge. Abelia isn't cold hardy across the country. If winter temperatures drop below zero, it can freeze to the ground but it's resilient. Many times it'll come back and be blooming again by summer. This is a relatively new cultivar called Edward Goucher. The flowers are a little pinker and its growth habit is more compact. It doesn't get as tall and leggy as the old fashioned variety, so you don't have to prune it as often. That's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I have. We got to see some really interesting projects as well as the progress here at the Garden Home Retreat. Hope you picked up a few tips that you can use as you begin to think about the design of your garden home. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at pallensmith.com. On an upcoming episode of P. Allen Smith's Garden Home. There's something seedy going on in the garden, and the results are good things to eat. 
We'll visit with a watermelon grower who's won prizes for whoppers like these. And we'll celebrate this fruit in grand style. Discover why I'm so fond of sunflowers and how to grow and use gourds. It's a great project for kids. This show is full of practical tips that are sure to bring you a bountiful harvest. Mm -hmm.